but just a few people. Hi, every, so everyone know me? Yeah, today I am going to present on this paper, uh, Contract for Higher Order Functions. So we are going to talk about contracts, um, but unfortunately not this kind of smart contracts. Nope. Uh, so it's unfortunate that they have shared the same name, but what we're talking about uh, is contracts in as fu on the functions and programming languages. In particular, is uh, I will talk uh, this concept of contract uh, is is mainly popularized by this programming language called Racket, which is uh, one a dialect of Lisp, and yes, it has the tagline uh, "programming language, programming language." You get the joke, <laughs> yeah. So um, contracts can be useful in many contexts in both uh, static and dynamic languages. And for example, even though contract is originated from record, I think it, it's also, it can be also very useful to apply this concept in lang dynamic languages like JavaScript. Because as you all are familiar, um, everyone who started learning about JavaScript are kind of put off by this kind of uh, weird behavior of JavaScript where when you just put uh, the plus operator on some objects, you get uh, some unexpected result. So, so then, uh, because of this, does this mean that we just don't use JavaScript because it has this weird behavior of plus? Or why if there's some other solution, such as using contracts? So an ad hoc way of doing, uh, to work around this weird behavior of plus in JavaScript, for example, is that we can make use of um, assertions, right? So for example, here I write an assertion function and a custom add function, and it checks the argument a and b, and if it's not a number, it will just throw an error. So then I get a much, so I can be sure that my JavaScript program can have a much better, well-defined behavior, and not just crash randomly. So yeah, um, contract is most, uh, contract uh, grows uh, on top of this uh, idea of assertion, which we will uh, later go in. And you can see that it's a bit similar to the concept of types. So, so in a way, you can say that all, all types, all concepts of types can be represented as a contract. But there's also a bit, uh, a few differences. So for type, when you can do type checking at compile time. And when your, your program type checks, you can be sure that it will never go into error at runtime. At, on the other hand, contracts is only checked at runtime. So, and when there's a type error, or rather a, a contract violation error, your program would crash, or you need to handle the error. And as for type, um, the, the search space for type checking is uh, exhaustive. So, which means that once you program type check, you know that it works for all possible values of the type. But for contracts, it's non-exhaustive. So, we only check a value when you actually pass the value in. So, unless you pass it in all possible values to your function, you don't know whether, whether the value satisfy the contract. And while type is typically more powerful, it is also a bit more restrictive that uh, you, you have a more general restrict, you, you can only declare a, a more general definition of types. For example, you can only say that this function accepts an integer. But for contract, you can write it as any, you can write any functions to, to express your, your, your invariance. So for example, you can say that this function accept an uh, integer that is greater than zero. And similarly, um, in the more, more advanced type system, there's uh, this concept of dependent types, which, uh, which you can have, you can encode the type system constraint that depends on the term. And as for contract, you can, there's a similar concept called dependent contract that, uh, that um, depends, depends on the argument values and create a new contract. So here are a few kinds of uh, operation use cases that you can express in contracts, but not for static type. So for example, you can division is only accept on any, any integer or real number values except zero. For square root, if you, if you want to always return a real number, you have to operate on a number that is greater or equal to zero. So prob for probability, you only operate on values between zero and one. 
So those are the essential uh, higher level concepts, and we'll go into the uh, details of contracts. So uh, this is an example program in Racket. So a flat contract is basically similar to assertion. So by flat, it means that it can check whether something satisfies the contract uh, when the value is present. So you can check it immediately. So for example, here we, we just define a variable called balance. And we say that the variable balance must contain a real number value. So then if we, if we, we can set the balance to a new value like 10 minus 1, but if we pass it from both like a string, you will get a contract violation error. So all these are automatically checked by record. So you can also, like com for contract, you can also combine multiple contracts into a more, to make it more expressive. So from both here, I can say that uh, balance is a, is a variable that not only has to be real, but it has to be uh, greater or equal to zero for accounting purposes. So in this case, then if we set, try to set the balance to minus one, it will also result in a contract violation error. So we can also um, apply, you, we can also um, and add contract to a function. So for example, we can define a function contract here, where we have a add that takes in two numbers and return a number. So then in the second, second call, if you call it with a, with a string, it will also result in contract violation. And, and there's a, there's a termo terminology that's borrowed from math when you are operating on function contract, which is your arguments is basically the domain. So you have a contract, do domain contract and a range contract. The range it represents the contract for the value returned by the function. So, so here's another example where we have a square root and it says that it, it, accept, uh, it takes in a real and, oops, it takes in a real and real number that is greater or equal to zero and it, can o it will always return a real number. And this one is just make use of the uh, built-in record SQLT function because by default, the, beha the default behavior for record square root is that uh, it will return a complex number if you give it a negative number. So then here, instead of returning my uh, uh, complex number, it will just result contract violation. And here is, uh, below is how the paper notate the square root function, where you can either inline the lambda, uh, the, the function definition, or you can, you can define it as a label and you reference it later. So then there's also a concept of dependent contract, where you, you can, you can give even more express, you, you can express even more restrictions to the behavior of the function. So for here, it says that square root has to be a function that takes in a number that is greater than zero, and it return, the val, for the value it returns, when you square the result, it has to be approximately equal to the input value. And the reason we say approximate is due to the floating point nature. Yeah, so, so yeah, now, now we have the basic concept of contracts. We'll talk into the high order functions, which is the main point of the paper. So for example, let's say uh, we have a function called adder that takes in a number and it returns a function. So how, how do we know that these are the, the value, the, the function that is returned by adder is really a function that operates on that takes in a number and return a number. So here's another example where we have a sort by tag function, which basically it takes in a list of anything, and it also takes in a get tag function that helps you extract a real number from whatever element types you define, and it will sort the list based on the, the ranking returned by tag. So in this case, we need to enforce that get tag is a function of type that takes in anything, but always return a real number. So how do we con re restrict this? How do we know that get tech always satisfy this constraint? So the idea presented in the paper is that we do, in, since we cannot check the function immediately at the point we receive it, we instead do delay checking. So we, so we get the function value, and we create a new function that wraps the original function around, 
and we check the argument and value of the function when that rub function is being called. And another concept that's introduced in the contract is that in the paper is that contract is actually just like real life, contract is an agreement between two parties. So when a contract violation happens, some one of the party have to be responsible. So so that we know that whose fault it is, so that we can get that that responsible party to go and fix the code. So then the paper has this concept called blaming. So for example, you have this add function, it says it takes in two numbers and you give it uh, a string. So whose fault is this? So it's your fault, right? And let's say somebody implement the add function incorrectly. Instead of, instead of returning a number, it just, for in this simple case, it just return a string. But in a more complicated uh, real world scenario, you can imagine a very complicated function, somebody might implement it incorrectly. So in this case, you pass in the numbers, but you get back a string. So of course, there's a contract violation error, and whose fault is it? So maybe in this case, uh, it's quite obvious that it's the implementer's fault. And in general, you have, so in general, when you have a function, and you, you will blame according to this. In the, in the domain of the function, you blame the caller. So the arguments, because the arguments is provided by the caller. And for whatever that is returned, it is the caller's responsibility that okay. it satisfies the contract. So then, for first order function, it's, a, it's quite simple. But then, when you go into fi higher order functions, it can be, become a bit more difficult. So for example here, it says that uh, the get tag function is promise that it takes in any, num any argument and return a real number. And down here, we have uh, some example list where the get tag function incorrectly assume, uh, make an incorrect assumption of the, the elements of the list. For example, here, the first example is uh, the get tag is just identity, and it expects that the list is just a list of numbers. So then when, when, there's a, when it returns a string instead, whose fault is that? So, and it, things can be, become a bit uh, even more strange when, when you do, when you do, you can, you can do many different kinds of things. For example here, you, we just have a strange kind of identity function that it takes in a function, and it says that it promised to take in a function that accept anything and return anything. But it's returning something that promised that is accepting a number and return a string. So, but it's just returning the same function. So then you just pass in the identity function and you pass in the argument, and then what happens, right? So, so then, so then if you try to reason this with just uh, just words, then uh, things can become uh, a bit confusing. So then we use, make use of the, the lambda calculus and some mathematics way to define, define precisely who is to blame in every kind of situation. So the idea of blaming is a bit similar to the contravariant concepts in type theory. So then when you, which, it, which means that when, when something, uh, when, the, when the types, when you are going into from the, from, from an argument position to like a return value position, then the blame party is swapped. So for example, here you have a higher order function that takes in a function that takes something greater than nine and return between zero and 99. So in the first place, you blame the colleague. At the second place, you blame the caller instead. And finally, when the return value, you call, blame the colleague. You get get how this, right? Yep. So it takes in takes in a function that accept that promise that 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 says that it, it only accepts something that is greater than nine. So G has to promise that it only it will only give this function something that is greater than nine, and in this example, it's giving it zero. Yep. So then so then G so it, it becomes that even though this is the first position. But it's inside uh, argument of inside argument, so 
So it's, uh, it's like you have a positive, negative, which I'll discuss later. So then here it becomes that G's fault that is passing, passing the number zero. So then uh, now we go into the formal part of the paper, which uh, the paper, it presents this, uh, this language called lambda con. So lambda con is basically uh, just a simple extension of the basic uh, simply type lambda calculus. Uh, are you guys familiar with it? Okay, so, so um, <laughs> yeah. So this is basically lambda calculus. So, so lambda, the way you see it is that you define the expressions and it's just a simple rules of saying, saying like from both you can say that an expression is uh, something that is either a function, which in, in this case is represented as a lambda x followed by an expression, or an application which is like you have an expression applied to another expression and so on. So you have a variable, you, the, the one is like you can have a plus addition, like a, one expression plus another expression. So, uh, so most of, uh, so there's quite a bit of rules, but uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we'll focus on only a bit due to time constraint. So I'll just go into the one that makes the difference. So the first part is that it says that uh, a lambda con program is consists of this uh, consists of this definition. So it consists of uh, one or more Valrec declaration, and the the way it called Valrec is because uh, is is it means re recursive value, and the Valrec is borrowed from ML. So it's it's all the declaration is mutually re recursive. So this is what it means. And here you have a when you have a Valrec declaration, you have a x, which is a variable, and you have a contract expression. Oops. So you have a contract expression that says the contract that's guarding this variable, and a body expression, which is the definition, the implementation for this variable. So then for the next part, uh, so these are the addition of the expressions in contract-related ex expression in LambdaCon. So it says that uh, other than the standard expression, uh, an expression can also be a contract that takes a, 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 a function contract from one from a domain to a range. So that's the arrow. So, so this one. And for this, it says that it's a flat contract. So it basically, is, you expect a predicate. And below here is just a, some helper function for you to uh, operate on this contract. So for example, asking whether, whether this expression is a flat contract or not. So then after we know the syntax, we go into the evaluation rule for lambda con. So for, for the first part, it says, uh, is, what it says is basically this, uh, you have a program you, with a series of Valrec and a main expression, and you, op, you evaluate from the top to bottom. And you evaluate the, exp, uh, the uh, contract expression first before you evaluate the body expression. And finally, after all the Valrec is evaluated, you evaluate main. So then for down the express evaluation for expression, it just says that when you have a function contract, you evaluate the domain expression first, and then you evaluate the range. And for, for a flat contract, you just evaluate inside. And then the reduction semantics. So this is, so for this, we focus on this part which basically says about the behavior of the helper function. So it just says that flat P will return true if it is a flat contract. Predicate, predicate the predicate function, pred, will uh, return the, the, the predicate function that is inside a flat contract. Domain, just get a domain range, get a blade range. And otherwise, if you pass in the different type of contract, it will just uh, result in errors. And then this is the big type rules. <laughs> but for, for us, we just need to focus the top. So, so the top here is the contract related ones. And so we just narrow down. And the, the type rules is quite straightforward. What it mainly do is that if you see the initial expression, it, it looks like 
oh, you can you can define any kind of expression to be a flat contract, but actually it's not. Because here the type rule says that it's only if the expression have a type that takes in a T, a type T and returns a Boolean, then only it can become a, a flat contract that of type of type T. So it's like only a predicate function can be lifted into a type uh, a flat contract. And for the for the for this rule, it just says that uh, you can only construct a function contract from two smaller contracts, and the two the two smaller contract can either be uh, be a flat contract or also some other function function contract. And the other parts are just uh, the helper functions type. And then here, this one looks a bit long, but basically, uh, what it says is this: the for the con for the x for e one. For e one is the is it is the expression uh, is the contract expression, and it just says that uh, the contract expression the type of the contract expression is derived from all the previous Barrett declaration of x. So it, and and as for the e two is the body expression is uh, you determine the type based on all the Valrex de declarations. And, and the main function is, is also depend on all Valrex declarations. And down here is just uh, some auxiliary type that is just a tuple of types to show that, okay, this program is well typed. And so, so, so what this means is actually that our uh, Valrex declarations are all mutually recursive, but a contract rec declaration can only reference uh, Previous Valrec declarations. So then we we go through all 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 the rules just now, but there's a small problem, which is that we haven't really defined like uh, when the contract is actually used, because if you if you look at it, it only says that uh, you you just apply the value directly, so the value the contract expression e one is not actually used. So now we go into the the part that is actually handling the contract enforcement and what it calls it, this one for this expression is called a uh, um, monitor expression or in the paper is also called a uh, obligation expression and it's written in this exponential notation and the way to read this is this uh, the main the main expression is the expression that's being monitored so the big e and the e on top is the contract expression that guards the that guards the the main expression, and the following two is are actually blame labels. So the first, the first, uh, the second x is the label for the positive party, what's called a positive party, and the second, uh, the third label is for what's called a negative party. So you you have these two parties that's positive, negative, and you can imagine they they are all being swapped. And and another way to interpret this is that you can think of the positive party as the producer of the expression, the one that implement the expression, and the negative party is the consumer, the one that use, make use of the expression. So uh, obligation expression, they are expression that enforce the contract. And, and one thing to note is that uh, in the final, in the, in, in, the, in the end of the section, it says that you, you don't actually need to write this uh, obligation expression yourself because uh, this will be automatically generated by the program. So uh, we just extend the uh, expression and type rules for, for the obligation expression. So we just say that if, uh, so expre an expression can also be this. And also that if uh, E1 is of type T and if E2 is of type T contract, then the e E1 monitored by E2 is also of type T. So we just erase the type of uh, E2. So these are the evaluation rules. And what it basically say is that when you have a obligation expression, you evaluate the contract first before you evaluate the main body. And, and for this, it says that uh, a value can also be a function value that's monitored by a a, a function contract that is, has been fully evaluated to a value. And, and down here are two rules for, for the, so, so yeah, so after this, the, the, main, the main thing to note is the two, two of the reduction at the bottom. 
So the first one is operated on the flat contract, which basically say that if you have a value and monitored by a flat contract, there's also a value. So which means from where you can imagine from where you have a integer and monitored by a, a flat contract with a integer predicate. Then you just reduce to this expression that you give v1 to v2. So like you give the number, you give the number value to the number predicate. And if it returns true, you just give back the value. Otherwise, you blame P. So flat contract, we always blame the positive party. And then for the bottom is that if you have a function value and you are monitored by a function contract, then the way you reduce is this. You, you, take, the domain, you take the domain of the function contract and you use it to monitor the V2 value. So the argument, so V2 is the argument. So you want to apply an uh, argument V2 to V1. V1 is the function. So you, you use the V3 to monitor the V2. And, and, then, and then you apply this whole thing to V1. And for the result returned by V1, V2 applied to V1, you, you, you use V4 to monitor it. And one thing to note is that inside here, when you do, when you do monitoring on an argument, so you extract out the domain, the blame parties are swapped. So originally it's, it's a PN, and then here is the NP. So this is how the, the blame calculus is actually uh, saying that, okay, this is how you should blame the parties when, you, when you're doing function application. So here is the example we have just now that got a bit of confusion. So you have the G that takes in this, and let's see how it's so then inside G, uh, it, it call func the function f with 0, which it violates the contract. And we will see that how, how it reduces. So you have this function, you, and you pass in this uh, constant function f, which is like lambda x, but you ignore and return just 25. So at first, the p positive is g, negative is mean, and then you take you takes the you takes the domain you takes the domain and you put the argument inside and then you this is the domain if you see and then you swap you swap the label and then here inside the definition of g it is calling this function with zero so let's see how it goes so it becomes zero monitored by the domain which is greater than nine. So it basically say that zero has to be greater than nine. And, and then here is swap again. So the positive is G, negative is main. And then here it still remain the same. So up is the same as above. So main and G. And then it becomes this. So it says because uh, zero becomes a flat value and greater than nine is a flat contract. It just says that uh, if 0 is greater than 9, then you just return 0. Otherwise, you blame G. So the end result is G. So the other way you can, you can uh, monitor contract is, uh, is just by writing a wrapper function. So this one you can implement in any kind of uh, programming language because it's just a function. So it's, a wrap is just a function that takes in a contract and, uh, and the value and two blame labels and it returns either the value or, the, or, or have a race error. So the first part is that it's just the same way. If it's a flat contract, you just call the value with the predicate. And if it's true, you return the value. Otherwise, you blame error, blame the positive. Then for function contract, it's also the same as before. So you take in the domain and the range contract. And down here, you give back a new function that's wrapped. So it takes in, you give back a function that takes in y. And once you get y, you, you wrap the whole thing. So inside, you wrap the uh, y argument with this uh, domain contract. And you swap the blame parties. And, you, and then after you wrap this, you apply to x. Okay. And, then, and then for the result of x, you wrap this with this expression which is the range. Okay. So like the, inside the paper, they give uh, the example of uh, wrapping a square root function. 
and it's a bit long, so I'm not going to cover. But the main thing you will notice is that down here you can see that uh, the, the rub square root is blaming the correct parties when it's applying the arguments and value result. So then, uh, so then now we know the obligation expression. Next thing is uh, how, how do we con uh, compile this contract? So the way we, we are going to do is, is that uh, we first find all variable occurrences of a, of a variable that is guarded by a contract and we replace that with an obligation expression and then we will use the rub helper function to rub this, uh, turn this ob obligation expression into a rub function. And the main thing we need to make sure is that uh, the compilation will have the correct uh, blame label propagation. So the way I, uh, I, I think of a simple example to imagine how, how, how to see this. So let's say we have a very simple program, which we define a variable invalid, which is supposed to be a number, but we give it a value foo, string, we give it a string value. So then, so then at the body, we are going to, if the body is just a, the reference to invalid, but it will eventually be com compiled into an obligation expression. So here, like, we have two missing labels and how do we label it? So the way to do it is that you just see that, okay, this is a flag contract and flag contract always blame the positive party. And in this case, it's the definition of invalid that is false. So then it becomes just this. And then, yeah, so then the paper give these three evaluator functions, the E, EFH, and EFW. And the way to read this is this, uh, EP, EP is actually just the core language, which basically is like the regular lambda calculus. So you can think of it like a lambda, cal a lambda calculus without contract. So you can actually compile actually uh, you can actually compile a language with contract into a core language that don't know about contract. And then EFH is just stand for flat hawk, and EFW stands for flat rub. And and then here the, there's two auxiliary functions IP and CIP. So IP just means obligation insertion. And here the C means compilation. And then, uh, and then one claim in the paper that is made is that all these three evaluator functions are equivalent. So it's that you, so which means that you can use any of these uh, evaluation strategy to implement a contract in your language. But in the end, they, they all result in the same, same value. So for example, if you, you can compile it to a core language, like for example, you have a, you have a, superset of JavaScript that support contract and then you can compile it just to a core language which is JavaScript. And, and then as for the flat hawk and rub reduction, we, uh, we just go back to the definition earlier. So earlier we have this uh, flat and hawk definition for the reduction already. And then you also add in a new reduction rule which is rub, which basically it means that when you have a lambda expression, that's guarded by a, fun a function contract, you can rub it immediately. Just notice that uh, for, for the hog rules, it is that you, you have to have a va function value that is applied to another value, then only you can reduce. As, as for rub, you can reduce it once you get a lambda, one lambda value inside. And then it just says that uh, the, the FH rule, which is the flat rub rule, it's just the normal normal reduction rules plus the flat and hot rules. And flat rub is just the, the reduction plus the flat and rub rules. And, and then this one, the CIP rules is in the appendix. And it looks like a lot of rules, but actually the, it all boils down to these few rules because all the others, they are just propagating the labels. So we will just first uh, look at the I, I expression, I, I rules, which is the, which is called this because uh, it's inserting the obligation expression into the program. So here it just says that uh, I operates on P and then for every VARAC declaration, it's just doing this. So it's just using this IE helper 
and it's passing, so it's giving this uh, E expression inside, it's processing this expression inside with the program, and also the X, so X is like the positive body, so record, so, so you, are, you are in X, so that here is X, and the last argument is just the empty set, which says, which, which is used to keep track of our free, free, free variable, and, the, and then lastly you compile the main function, which is E3. And then for the for the IE for the definition for IE, I noticed that there's a few actually a few typo in the paper. Yeah. Because because you are not supposed to swap the blame parties when you're compiling it. The the only the, the only party that is that, that is going to swap the blame parties are, are the obligation expression. So here it just says that uh, when you have a lambda expression, you just pass forward, go inside the expression, plus that you include the y, so you include the argument, the variable for the lambda into the field variable list set, so that you know that, okay, the, the original variable is shadow. And then this one also, like E1, E2 is an application expression, and, and the labels are not supposed to be swapped. So it's just the same labels. And then the main thing is just this, uh, this expression, which just says that when you encounter a variable, and and the variable is inside this uh, program, Valrec, so this variable is one of the Valrec declaration, then, and, and also if the variable is not shadowed, then you turn it into an obligation expression. So this is how the I go through the whole program and find whatever this X is and turn into obligation. So once we have the obligation ex expression, then this compiler, contract compiler is actually quite simple. The contract compiler is actually going through this whole program. So you have this uh, expression tree. You just go into every one of it and see that, and until it reach an obligation expression, then you change it to a call to the wrapper help, uh, the helper wrap function. So that's, that's all about it. And lastly, the paper also briefly talk about how do you extend lambda con to also support uh, the dependent contract. And, and if you see the rules, it's actually quite uh, simple, only a few rules. So the, the one thing that changes is that for dependent contract, the range part of the expression becomes a, expre a function that takes in the T1 and return a contract. So it becomes like a higher order contract. And then here, the, the dependent contract has a D label up here. And de for dependent contract, uh, the reduction is as follow. And the main thing that is different from the normal function contract is that other than, other than, uh, other than you monitoring it, for the, for the result part, so for the outer part, which is the range v2, you give it the argument which is v4, so v4 is the argument, so you give v, v4 to v2, which will produce a contract value, and you monitor the whole thing with this. And what the paper uh, didn't address is actually there's a problem in this uh, dependent contract calculus, which is that if you notice, you have an argument v4, and when you, when you pass the v4 to v3, V4 is being guarded by V1 to, to make sure that uh, to make sure that V4 satisfies the constraint. But when you pass V4, V4 to V2, it is not monitored. So which means let's say you pass in a high order function to, to the dependent contract. Technically the dependent contract can give some random value that is invalid to the function, and there won't be any error here. And this, this problem is actually uh, addressed in, uh, further on uh, in later papers. And, and so for example, in the language record, uh, this problem is solved. So that's all for my talk. And, and this is the conclusion for the paper. The contribution is that uh, this paper uh, introduced uh, the concept of contracts for this uh, dynamic checking. So, you, so for lambda con, you can see that the lambda con is actually a type, uh, a type language. But you can also use contract for both type and dynamic type, static and dynamic type language. And, and this paper uh, it introduced the con idea of function wrapping so that you can do delay checking on these high order functions. 
and also the con concept of blame parties uh, on how how you can uh, assign assign blame correctly to each parties. Yeah. So to learn more, uh, there are plenty of resources here. So first, the first one is uh, the complete uh, documentation for contracts on record, and second one is a series of lectures on the com complete uh, lecture on this uh, contract calculus, which uh, I recommend anyone who is interested to read. Yeah, that's all, and thanks. <laughs> Any questions? How do you use this, this into your work or, or into a project or into... into oh, so... For me, uh, I mean, as an engineer, this is already higher level or higher order than I think. Yeah. So how, how, uh, how practically I use that to maybe, you know, demonstrate something or yeah. implement a concept or, or check? This seems to be more like checking things. Yeah. Or so, so this one it actually depends on the language support, and contract is uh, not that well known right now, but but one particular example is a record contract is very well supported in record. So if you if you see look at the record code, uh, a lot of the record code they 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 are all guarded by contracts, and there's this thing that uh, once you have contract is actually uh, contagious because because uh, wh when you write a program that has contract. And something went wrong. If you is going to blame someone, and what happens is that if you write a library with contract, and somebody somebody else write a library that uses your library, and when something goes wrong, then then you will blame the 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 other libraries that call this library, and and then and then and then the the library will be like, oh, it's not my fault because the user passed in the wrong value. Then they will write their own contract to guard against. The, the usage of the library, the other library. So it becomes everyone will like write their own contract and, and try, to, try to blame. Cover your yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a, so you, you can, you, you can, in a way you can, you can, like if you are in a normal languages, I think like from both, if you search for, let's say JavaScript, you can actually find there's a, 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 a few contract libraries available, which so so that's something I'm also thinking of looking into. So and yeah, this is still a relatively new idea, at least in the mainstream programming languages. And and what I hope is that with our uh, introduction like this one, uh, they can be uh, slowly gain adoption, because I think is uh, contract is especially useful for dynamic type language. And these sort of uh, topics, uh, in what sort of journal is this published? Is it in computer science or is it more mathematics or, or logic or symbolic stuff? This is, uh, for this particular paper, is published in the ICFP. The, in, yeah, functional programming. Yeah. So it's in programming languages. I think, I think the concept is quite, it's quite okay. It's just that the, the typing rules are not really needed, like, I think. It's yeah. Like explain the, the concept of it, right? Yeah. I think for the purpose of the paper, it went into a lot of, uh, you know, like very formal details. That's right. Just to prove that everything is fine as well. Yeah. There's also the, the I think they, the reason they put in types is because they also have the uh, soundness proof to prove that uh, lambda count is sound. sound. Actually, I put it behind, so they have this kind of rules, but I think don't need to go into. But basically, this is what you need when you introduce a language concept. You have to say that, okay, your language is sound and so on. Your, your language is correct. So, so, yeah. And also, I think the other thing is that they make it more implicit because, because from both if you if you use a contract on languages like record, then you, you, you can actually write any expression for the contract. It doesn't, it does not, from where let's say you write a flat contract, it does not really need to return just true and false. From where you can just give it a random value. But for record, of course, uh, it treat everything else other than false as true. That's the behavior. So, so you have to, it, so, so if you, so if you use contract in a dynamic type language, it becomes that you have to have some extra work to make sure that 
your contract is sort of well written because technically you can write a very complicated contract and it does not necessarily need to be correct yeah so so that's that's something that they still like need to work on i think in your examples on racket you, you use like an end expression to combine multiple yeah like, predicates but it's not the regular end i think right? yeah so it's is it, end? yeah so so if you see racket is a n slash c yeah. so in racket in racket your expressions can be of any your expression can be anything like you your expression no your your variable can contain special character so it's there's very few reserve characters. The only reserve characters are like space, bracket, and stuff. So you can use things like slash as part of the expression. Okay. So you can see that the any slash c is actually, the whole thing is an identifier. So why can't you use the regular n in the language? Uh, the regular this regular n operates on Boolean. Okay. NC, what, what NC does is that it takes in a number of contracts and it gives you back a new contract. Yeah, so, so you can imagine like from where you have boolean, right? You, let's say you write a NC for two, two contracts. So you take in a contract one, contract A and contract B, and you return a, a new lambda that takes in an X, and then you say that if A apl X apply to A, returns true, then and X apply to B returns true, then I returns true. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah. And, and there's actually a lot more into the contract. Like this paper is uh, one of the earlier work and following this, uh, there are much more concepts of contracts being developed. And this racket language is actually, it's quite a recent language, is it? I mean, is it? Uh, it's actually a long time already. Yeah. At first it's actually called a PLT scheme. So, so it's, it's not like an entirely new language, but it's evolved from scheme. And then eventually it becomes uh, more, more and more uh, distinct from Scheme. Then it changed the name to Racket. Are there any other languages that are super suited for contracts? Because you say Racket comes with it, it supports contracts very well. Are there any other languages that also has similar support? So not that I'm aware of. But I will be pretty interested to from both add contract to JavaScript because you can see I, I think it's a it's a well it's, it's very well suited for dynamic type and yeah it could greatly help programs like JavaScript to to make it uh make your program better behave and and actually if you see the main the main thing the main essential about contract is this uh labeling that is not really uh, available in dynamic languages, which means we need to add a bit more language support so that we can know about the la labels. So the, the, the blame calculus itself is actually quite simple because as you can see, once you, can, once you have the labels, you can write the rub function pretty trivially. The problem is that, let's say you have a function f, you, you have to know where is f defined before you can do the blame assignment. But in former JavaScript, you pass in an anonymous function inside the the other functions they don't really know where this function is defined so they can't really say that that they, they can't really blame the input function so so that is something that i think need to add a bit of language support although not too much yeah if you if you search for for more contract js uh it's a yeah it's a library but it use a macro system called uh Sweet JS is like a macro system for JavaScript. So you need a bit of uh, this kind of uh, meta programming to assign the blame label correctly. And that's one thing that is uh, be beautiful about Racket, which I think is that uh, it has this very rich language support. Because in, in Racket, the contracts are also implemented as macros. And when you, when you write these programs, you can you can see see you can actually see where the the contracts are where where the error happens. So from both here, I I have this uh example. So let's if I run this, you can see that it says that okay. This uh broke this thing broke its own contract and 
the the thing is uh, blaming is that the anonymous module, which means this this yeah this function itself. So so there's this uh, very rich uh, highlighting that is on top of contract that makes it even more helpful because when you when when something happens, you can actually see that which part of code is at fault, and then you can debug your your code quickly. There's also spec in um, closure space, which is a little bit similar to this. Yeah, probably. But I guess they don't, they don't have the blame thing. Yeah. <laughs> blame is very useful because just one thing is that, of course, you, with, if, if, you don't do, if you don't use blaming, you can implement blameless contract in any, in any languages right now. The problem is just that when you get an error, you are help, helpless. It's like you only know that something's wrong. You don't know what happens, what went wrong. And it's just the un, like the, if you're in JavaScript, you have the undefined error. And it's like, why is it there? You don't know. It's more like assertions, right? I mean, yeah. like some assertion happened, then something's thrown. You don't know who called yeah. it. But you know and the assertion was uh, triggered. That's, that's right. So it's especially important in the high order function con context because your yeah. function you, you are passing functions around and when you're passing functions around and something went wrong, you need to trace back to the source. Yeah. Great. <laughs> that's all. Thanks. Thank